Good morning and welcome to today's virtual webinar, which is being hosted by CPI Media Group and Mindcast. My name is Mark Forker and I'm the editor of Computer News Middle East, which is the region's leading IT, technology and enterprise magazine. And I'm delighted to have been afforded the opportunity to moderate this morning's session. The subject title of today's virtual webinar is Stop Brand Personation Attacks Beyond Your Perimeter Protection. In this era of the digital economy, everything is online. So if you provide your customers and partners with secure web access to your systems or have a well-known brand, then it is very likely that your brand is already being exploited via email or the web. This session will focus on the scale of the online brand exploitation problem, provide some specific examples across multiple industries, and we'll discuss the best practices for finding, blocking, and ultimately taking down domains, both email and web, which are ripping off legitimate brands. For all our attendees, I wanna give you all a warm welcome, and I wanna give you a quick overview of the running order of today's virtual webinar. Werno Givers, Regional Manager, Middle East at Maincast, will deliver a keynote, uh, a quick short keynote to kickstart today's proceedings. Uh, then Roy Ram, Product Manager at Maincast, and Ronald Doubledam, Senior Specialist at Emerging Products, will then deliver a very comprehensive and in-depth presentation that will look at a range of key points, including ultimately how you can learn to fight back and gain control over your brand's online use. Following their presentations, I will then moderate a Q&A session, which will explore some of the most interesting findings that have emerged from the presentations. At this point, I'd really, really like to emphasize and encourage our attendees to submit their questions via the chat function on Zoom, and I will then chair uh, your questions on your behalf during the Q&A session. So, so don't be shy, I can confirm that uh, Ronald and Roy are nice, nice guys, and uh, they'll be very open to your questions. So please feel free. We want to make this as engaging and interactive as, as we possibly can. Uh, so please do feel free to, to share your questions uh, throughout the session, and I'll share them uh, during the Q&A. So that's enough for me. Uh, without further ado, let me hand you over to Werno Givers uh, to kickstart uh, today's virtual webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us um, on how to combat the brand impersonation of tax webinar. I'm confident that you'll find the session uh, very useful and informative. But before we kick off, I, I thought, um, you know, I wanted to give you a brief introduction on the evolving threat landscape and how to address these threats with a multidimensional approach. So disruption is a real thing. Uh, we see most of the news points to malicious payloads and, and rightly, rightly so. Uh, given the rise of ransomware and impersonation attacks. However, hackers has grown wise to the defenses of the industry and, and have turned their attention to human error and uh, uh, brand or, or domain attacks specifically. So I think technology has uh, permeated every nook and cranny of our personal and professional lives, and it, it will become even more omnipresent with new advancements. While technology creates many efficiencies and, and opportunities, it also increases risk. In fact, uh, technology is smack bang in the center of today's every real business disruption triangle. And uh, this triangle typically uh, um, consists of or comprises of uh, dependency on our own technology and systems and interdependency on other organizations, technologies and systems and increasing industry regulation often intend to protect the data uh, residing within these technologies. So from a dependency point of view, the majority of businesses and, and uh, operations are now dependent on digital technology. Um, and some, uh, you know, and when one goes down, it can result in a loss of productivity and revenue. And if we think of the interdependency, each organization has invested to connect its internal systems. But in order to streamline business processes, transactions, and efficiencies, uh, organizations also um, have to connect to each other. Uh, one organization's exploited weakness can quickly have dire consequences on an entire supply chain. So if we think of industry regulation uh, as a third point to that, uh, which is as digital um, transformation progresses, so is the number and the types of sophisticated threats. So much cybersecurity regulation is um, intended on securing data. 
being cited um, for failing to comply with certain industry regulations can throw organization into disarray. So if we look at the evolving threat landscape and, and if we just talk about email per se, given that more than 94% of your attacks start with email, we've seen the evolution of, of email security version one around 98 being the basic hygiene, which was antivirus and anti-spam. Um, and version two is the rise of the targeted attacks. This is where we've seen uh, ransomware being introduced, exploit kits, phishing, business uh, email compromise, crimes, etc. And then version three extends beyond the traditional perimeter. And I think that's really where we're going to focus today to give you some more context around this and, and talk about the domains you own and the domains you don't own and what happens in the wild. Uh, with your company's brand and reputation. So for us at, at MomCast, we break this down in three distinct zones. Zone one, which is your perimeter as it stands today. If you think of your house, you've got a, a perimeter wall and that protects anything from coming into your property. Same thing goes for your organization. Your perimeter today is there to defend any incoming threats or any outgoing threats. If we then think of zone two, which is inside your perimeter, and if we use the analogy again of your house, you've got gates inside your house um, to stop any threats from moving from one room to, to another. The same goes for your organization. At zone two, we wanna protect the organization from any internal threats. And you wanna protect the organization from human error, which is a very, very real threat. We know that humans are the, you know, the, the um, weakest link in any organization and more than 90% of data breaches are caused by humans. And then lastly is zone three. And zone three looks now beyond your perimeter and that's moving from a perimeter based type of security to a pervasive type of security. And this is specifically looking at where and what's happening with your brands. And as I mentioned earlier, this talks to the fact of the brands that you or the domains you own and the domains you don't own. Um, there's so many examples that we've seen where an organization's website was scraped, it's made live somewhere else, and then your suppliers or customers are targeted. So the supply chain is targeted with your brand and they'll either harvest credentials uh, of your customers or enforce something else um, down the line in terms of um, an, an exploit. So lastly, just to, to close off, I think, um, we launch a state of email security um, report every year. And last year, we've seen 88% um, of all the respondents experienced either some form of spoofing or domain hijacking. And more than 80,000 phishing sites was registered from July to September. So this threat is, is real and organizations are struggling with this um, because you don't know what you don't know. And a lot of the times it's only when your customer or your supplier informs you that your brand is being used outside the organization. So um, it's crucial to have that visibility and to know what's happening with your brand and to be able to protect your brand and your customers and suppliers at the same time. So hopefully that would uh, set some context for today's session. Uh, both um, Ronald and Roy is going to talk you through this uh, specifically around our DMARC services as well as our brand exploit protect services and how that will help your organization and your brand uh, in the wild. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it back to Mark to uh, kick off the introduction for Ronald. Well, no, thanks, Emilian, for that. That was excellent. I think you, you did what you set out to do, and that was to provide context uh, for, for the guys that are doing the presentation. And, and you've, you talked about the dependency on, on digital technology. So I think you've set the stage uh, perfectly for, for Ronald and Roy now, who are going to deliver presentations. But up first is, is Ronald Double Dam. So over to you, Ronald. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Werner. Uh, um, so Werner was talking about uh, domains that you own and domains that you don't own. So um, first we are going to focus on protect, protecting the domains that you own with DMARC and DMARC Analyzer. But just to start off with, um, what is DMARC? Let's uh, watch a video. 
Did you know that more than 60% of all worldwide email traffic is being marked as spam or phishing? Besides the emails you send, there might be others sending emails on your behalf. They mask their identity by sending it on behalf of your domain. Both emails will be delivered to the inbox of the receiver. Email services like Gmail, Hotmail, and others generate detailed reports of all the emails they receive. These reports are called DMARC reports and provide insight into all the IP addresses sending email on your behalf. With our tool DMARC Analyzer, you can detect if someone is sending malicious email. After detecting this, you can instruct email services like Gmail, Hotmail, and others to reject these malicious senders. So the next time this sender tries to send an email on your behalf, the email receiver will reject this. The result? Your subscribers will only receive authorized emails from you. Are you aware who is sending email on your behalf? Want to know more about DMARC? Visit our Knowledge Center at DMARCanalyzer.com. Okay, so um, one of the biggest problem that email has already had since the start of email back in the 80s is that it has never had any protection against identity theft or spoofing. So control over who is using your domain. And this resulted in sophisticated and targeted attacks where malicious actors, actors are use, using your email domains to reach out to your customers your partners or your prospects and damage your brand through the action of requesting money, stealing credentials or other malicious activities. So we've seen all the news about email scams and the enormous losses that organizations suffer. The dirty dozen at the right side of these slides are the 12 companies with which have lost most. These 12 companies lost more than $400 million because of phishing scams. So really a huge damage. So there are multiple types of phishing attacks. Uh, on one hand, the deceptive phishing, it's well known by consumers. Um, with this type of phishing, a large audience is receiving phishing emails. Most likely those that, that audience are consumers. The losses per phishing email are quite low but the total losses are, are huge because it's spread over a large audience. On the other side, there is whaling, a phishing type where top executives are attacked by malicious emails. The fissure is targeting a specific executive like the CFO, the CTO, or the CEO. They put a lot of effort in these emails in, in the form of social engineering, where they look at the social media pages of that executive. This way they can build a bond with the person before they request them to transfer money or valuable data. And the impact is very, very high and really big. So according to FBI research, an average attack costs an organization $120,000. These attacks occur at large organizations, but also at smaller organizations. An attack will cause customers to stop dealing with an organization they will really abandon your organization. Before DMARC, organizations were unable to prevent these attacks to happen. Now with DMARC, there's a change to mitigate the impact of, this, of attacks. So what do you need to do as an organization? It's that simple, just implement DMARC. Publishing DMARC gives you insight in the outbound email environment and eventually you can determine which sources can se send email on your behalf. So on behalf of your domains. And then you move to a point where all the other sources are not trusted and will be rejected. So that's really the focus of DMARC, identifying your sources, set them up correctly, and then reject everything which is not DMARC compliant. So traditionally, uh, traditional security is only securing your inbound gateway. DMARC is used by Mimecast for inbound protection as well. And this means that if someone is sending a message to your gateway, the Mimecast gateway, 
And Mimecos will do a DMAR check and based on that, determine what to do with that message. Now Mimecast offers also the outbound protection part. With outbound protection, you can get a 360 degree visibility on your outbound emails. With Mimecast, DMARC Analyzer, you can see who is sending email on behalf of your domain. So we can see all third parties using your domains, but also who is maliciously, maliciously doing that. We have full insight in the authentication on certain email streams. And on top of that, after authenticating the authorized sources, we can get control and start rejecting, well, the ones that are not set up correctly. This way, the domain owner can determine which sources need to be blocked by the recipient. This will give you full insight and control over your email environment. So some history about, the, about DMARC. Um, PayPal was initiator in 2010 to block malicious emails that were sent on their behalf. In 2010, PayPal suffered a large phishing attacks where their domain, their domain was used to send fake invoices to millions of people. So they teamed up with Microsoft, Gmail and Yahoo, some large email providers, and they created an open standard called the DMARC standard. And in 2012, the DMARC standard was released to the public and became available for everyone. So DMARC, it's not really an authentication technique, but it relies on two existing authentication techniques, SPF and DKIM. SPF is a list of all sources that are authorized for your organization. And DKIM is a bit more newer technique and is based on key encryption to make sure that messages doesn't change from point A to point B. Because the domain owner and the source both need to work together, a malicious source can never reach alignment uh, on SPF and DKIM. And al alignment is really the most important, important part of DMARC in order to get control over your own domains. So this means you're in control of the domains that you own and that you can block unauthenticated messages from being sent on your behalf. Setting up DMARC can be done without setting up DKIM and SPF first. This really has to do with the three DMARC policies that are available. So the first policy, the non-policy, with, with that policy, a domain owner instructs recipients of emails from their domain to take no action on the message other than generating a report and send, the, uh, send that specific report to the email address, which can be found in the DMARC record, a DNS, re a DNS record. This way, as a domain owner, you will have visibility on who is using your domain. This could be a legitimate source like Marketo or Salesforce, or it could be a bad actor trying to fish your customers or partners. The reports that you will receive while being on a non-policy will give you the possibility to work on the authentication of all authorized sources. So that's really the focus. The focus is on the, auto, the authorized sources. Once all sources are authenticated, then we can move over to the policy enforcement stage where the domain policy is quarantined first. And in that specific situation, you instruct receiving mail servers when the message is not DMARC compliant to put that specific message in the junk folder. And later on, we move to the final step, which is called the reject policy. And in this situation, you instruct the receiving email server to reject the message that are not DMARC compliant. The recipient will never receive the message and the domain owner will be notified about this attempt in a DMARC report. Next to that, the malicious source will receive a bounce report, which will say that the message was rejected, which in fact means that any further attempts to use this domain to send out malicious stuff is not very useful. So they will absolutely move over to other domains without any DMARC protection. So what does the world look like without a DMARC solution? Um, DMARC is a free and open standard, and it's just a TXT record that needs to be implemented in the DNS of your domain. So why do you need a solution? Well, it's, it's rather simple. Um, when you start collecting reports, then you will start receiving emails with zip files. And those zip files contain XML data, so XML files. And well, those XML files well, are not really human readable. 
So the core functionality of DMARC Analyzer is to, to collect those um, DMARC reports, process the XML files, and make them visible in comprehensive and useful overviews. So to wrap up, DMARC is a must have and not really a nice to have for organizations. First of all, without DMARC, there is no visibility in the outbound email channel. Uh, with control, you can determine which sources can send email on your behalf. Um, well, this of course will protect your brand from being abused and you will eliminate the phishing and spam attacks. Because of that, your domain reputation will be better. So your inbox placement will absolutely improve. Also interesting for your marketing team are some opportunities, um, which, which are called BIMI and AMP. With BIMI, you can implement a logo in your email header. This way, the recipient of an email from your organization will see a logo before they open the message. AMP is a new way of sending emails where you have a menu in your email. And this way, a recipient can navigate in the email before they navigate to the website. Uh, both BIMI and AMP can only be used, and that's really important, if you have 100% DMARC reject policy in place. So the, the foundation for, of, of, of the, both marketing opportunities, BIM and AMP, is a DMARC reject policy. So um, let's move over to a short demo of the DMARC Analyzer console. It's, it's, it's a rather short demo. So if you want to have a more extensive demo, feel free to, to reach out to Mark or to one of the guys of, the, of, of Mimecast from our uh, Dubai office. Um, and I'm going to try to switch now. So let's uh, start with um, the overview that you will see when you log in in your DMARC Analyzer account. Um, the domain dashboard. The domain dashboard will give you an overview of the domains that you are monitoring with your DMARC Analyzer account. In order to start monitoring a domain, you have the possibility to create a DMARC record. And if you implement um, that DMARC record in your DNS for that specific domain, then it will take 24 up to 48 hours before you start receiving reports, which we call aggregated reports and forensic reports. And those aggregated reports uh, will you see in the, in the left sidebar of the DMARC Analyzer account. But first, let's have a look at the dashboard. On the dashboard, you will have an overview of the domains that you are currently monitoring. So in this specific situation, I have one active domain, which is called dmarcanalyzer.test. And I have also a couple of inactive domains. And it's really a, a, a good practice, a best practice to monitor not only your active domains, but also your inactive domains, especially when you are on a reject policy or a quarantine policy. Well, malicious senders are very smart guys. They will absolutely move over to your inactive domains, which are not protected. Um, as soon as you are on a reject policy. So it's really good to, to involve those inactive domains as well. Check if there is any legitimate volume on it. And if there's no legitimate volume on your inactive domains, then it's rather easy to move over with those inactive domains to a reject policy and to protect those inactive domains as well. So you will see the domains on the domain dashboard, the, the reporting volume, and a DMARC compliance percentage. And that DMARC compliance percentage is based on, like I mentioned in my presentation, DCAM verification and SPF verification. And over here, you will, will see some, some colors. Uh, the green color, as it's very obvious, that's, that's okay. So no homework, no homework to do. You will see a red part. Well, that's not really okay. And there's also a purple part. And the purple part has to do with alignment. And alignment is really an important um, uh, concept of DMARC because a domain owner is the only one who can create alignment. Um, a malicious sender is, is not able to create alignment and that is the part of DMARC that really makes DMARC a strong authentication technique. I mentioned that there are two different kinds of reports. So let's start, excuse me. I... 
wanted to select the first one. Okay, let's start with the aggregated reports. Um, a very useful report is the presenting source overview. On the presenting source overview, we will categorize all the sources based on DMARC compatible sources, non-compatible sources, forwarders, and failed sources. The DMARC compatible sources are most likely your legitimate ones because DMARC compatible sources are sources from which we know that they are able to send out DMARC compliant email. And well, over here you will see um, organizations like Rackspace, Amazon SES, uh, Google, Mailgun. So really the large organizations that are in general used to send email um, uh, on behalf of organizations. In this specific situation, you have the possibility to dive into the details and drill down to um, first um, the host names that are used and then the IPs, the specific IPs, in this case of Amazon SES, that are used to send out um, that specific email for you. If I click another time, then I will see also the authentication results. So you will get a very high level of detail of your DKIM verification, SPF verification results. And if there are any problems, then it will be presented. So in this specific situation, um, DKIM is not set. Um, there are perm errors, but in this specific situation, there is alignment. And the concept of alignment is really an important one. So you really have to uh, need access. You really need to have access to um, this level of detail in order to create alignment and to create um, positive DKIM and SPF verification. For each DMARC compatible source, we provide our customers with um, documentation for that specific source in order to set up DKIM and SPF. So these are really your easy wins. If you start with a DMARC project, then it's the best approach to start with your DMARC compatible sources. Because there, if you start monitoring um, your domains with, with DMARC, then it's also very likely that certain legitimate sources are not set up in a correct way. In that specific situation, they are failing the DMARC check and will turn up in your field section. And in that specific situation, you have to identify a source if it's legitimate or not. And if you have some doubts about it, then you can put it under investigation. And if you put it under investigation, then it's really a matter of reaching out within your organization in order to, to get clear if that specific source is, is a legitimate one or a malicious one. And if it's a legitimate one, then you have to reach out to, let's say, the one who has access to that specific source in order to set up SPF DKIM in a correct way. And then it will move over to your DMARC compatible sources. So this is the most important um, aggregated report, the presenting source overview. Um, I give another example, the detailed stats, the detailed stats overview is an overview that you will use um, if you are um, investigating uh, specific sources. So in case of the detailed stats overview, will, you will get a really high level of detail. It's almost the raw data of your XML. However, this is readable. Um, and in this specific situation, you get a lot of information like IP numbers, reporting organization, the volume, if it's compliant or not. And you also see a timeline. So in this specific situation, this is a rather constant um, email flow. So it's, it's sent on a daily basis. Well, that's completely different if you compare it to a situation where there's a spike on, let's say, every four weeks. In that specific situation, it might give you information about what kind of a source it is. Because if it's a spike of four weeks, then it's probably your monthly newsletter or it is also possible that, well, if it's a spike and then it stops and there is no volume and you anymore, well, in that specific situation, it's not very unlikely that it is a malicious sender who used your, your email domain one time in order to send out a large volume of email. The aggregated, these were, these were the aggregated reports. We also offer the possibility to collect forensic reports. And forensic reports are individual messages that are failing the DMAR check. 
So in this specific situation, you will see actual emails that are sent out on behalf of your organization, which were not DMARC compliant. And in this specific situation, you will, will get even more details. You will also get um, the from domain and not only the part be behind the ad sign, but also the part before the ad sign. So you will see the name of the actual user who is used to send out that specific email. Next to that, you will get information about the mail headers of that specific email, which will give you a lot of information and also the mail message. And in this specific situation, uh, you will see that we didn't um, store the, the, the actual body of an email. By default, we throw away the body of an email unless you upload a PGP key to your DMARC analyzer console. So the second um, email that we've collected over here is an email which was received while we were, we were uh, using a PGP key. So in this specific situation, there is, um, we've collected the, the body of the message. However, it's encrypted, it's PGP encrypted. And if we want to have access to, to the actual body, then I have the possibility to download this body to my desktop and decrypt it locally. Then I will, I will see the actual body of the email. So some additional features around um, aggregated reports and the forensic reports um, is the, the, the timeline. Um, we are constantly monitoring um, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. Um, it's really important to do that um, because, well, DMARC is based on SPF and DKIM. And if something thing changes in your DNS and an issue occurs, then you simply want to know that because that can have impact on your DMARC compliance. So we are constantly monitoring uh, DNS. And if there are any issues with your SPF, DKIM, or DMARC, then we will notify you on one hand um, in the timeline, but well, as soon as you are on a reject policy, well, then you don't want to log in on a daily basis. So we also provide a DNS monitor. And with the DNS monitor, you have the possibility to set alerts um, for your SPF record, DMARC record, and DKIM record. Um, you can um, create a, a alert for all your domains, but it's also possible to focus on certain domains and um, create alerts for specific domains. So this is a rather um, short overview of um, DMARC Analyzer. Like I mentioned, feel free to reach out to Mark or one of the Mimecast people in, if you want a more extensive demo. So I'm going to switch again to the presentation. So this was the software. Um, on top of the software, we um, also offer some additional services. So this is an overview of our managed service approach. And um, in case of a managed service project, um, we will assign one of our DMARC specialists to your um, DMARC project. And on a regular basis, we will, we will have meetings with, uh, with the customer in order to, to guide the customer from no policy or a non-policy to a reject policy, because that's really the challenge for an organization. Um, if you, it's really necessary to, to use a project approach. Um, otherwise, it's very likely that you start monitoring and after a year, you still will, um, you will be uh, on a non-policy. Um, there are different stages. So the onboarding stage, um, in case of the onboarding stage, we, we do a customer kickoff, um, load the domain, set up the users, set up the DMARC records, implement them in the DNS. Then we move over to the governance stage. Um, we will... Um, collect a couple of weeks of data before we can start with analyzing the data. Um, so we will gain visibility of the, all the mail flows, uh, identify ongoing authentication issues. And after a couple of weeks, we can move over the policy analysis stage. And the policy analysis stage is, um, let's say the most time consuming stage. So the, 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 the most important part of a DMARC project will be done in the policy analysis stage because, well, as soon as you have visibility on your email landscape, well, then you have to 
identify your sources, um, decide on whether they are legitimate or not. And in case of the legit legitimate sources, you have to set up SPF and DKIM in a correct way. And at some moment, um, you will see that, that you get rather close to a 100% DMAR compliancy. And that's really necessary to move over to the policy enforcement stage. In the policy enforcement stage, well, then you will first move over to a quarantine policy. You can do that step by step because there's a percentage tag in the DMARC record. So you can, for example, start with 20% quarantine. In that specific situation, 20% of your volume, which is not DMARC compliant, will end up in, a junk, in the junk folder. And um, the remaining part will be dealt with as it is as F as if it is a non-policy, so it will still be delivered as it was delivered before. And well, if you feel more comfortable about um, covering all the legitimate sources, then you can decide to move on with your quarantine policy to let's say 80% and with the reject policy, you can do exactly the same uh, until you are on 100% reject policy. Um, then it's not over. So if you are on a 100% reject policy, um, then, the, the, the stage active monitoring will start. And in that specific situation, you will use uh, the, 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 the notifications of DMARC analyzer in order to keep track of your um, SPF DKIM and DMARC settings. Because um, like I mentioned, um, it's really important to, to have an, 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 an pause on SPF and DKIM um, because that's really um, important to be DMAR compliant. Well, if something happens with your DNS settings or uh, a DKIM key gets get removed or, well, any other problem with your um, SPF or, or DKIM, well, that will have impact on your DMAR and that will have impact on your deliverability. And you, know, you, you simply don't want to lose legitimate email. So it's, it's, it's really necessary to, to, to monitor your SPF and DKIM settings if you are on a reject policy. So that's my last slide. I'm going to hand over to Roy, who's going to tell you more about Brent Exploit Protect and the domains that you don't own. Thank you, Ronald. So hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. I'm Roy Ram. I'm the product manager for Brand Exploit Protect. As stated before by Where Now and Ronald, uh, DMARC looks into the, main, the domains that you own. And we at Brand Exploit Protect try to look at into the visible web and try to find domains that you don't own, which might be impersonating your brand and trying to scam your employees or end users. So it's very likely that your brand is already being targeted by some bad actors trying to manipulate uh, your brand and target the customers of your customers. Attack tactics have evolved extensively over the years. Uh, brute forcing their way onto a network and into systems is just too hard. Uh, it's much easier to just set up a phishing website or impersonation attack. Uh, that's really the name of the game and attackers will use, will use trusted brands to deceive uh, their targets. So it's very likely uh, that your brand is already being used to target current and potential customers. And it's hard to really understand the risk and it's even harder to try and control it. So again, why is this such a big problem? Uh, if we just look at the numbers, we see a 30% increase in the number of phishing sites detected a 30% increase of phishing emails get, gets opened by targeted users and a 58% uh, increase in phishing attacks in the past 12 months. Uh, obviously with COVID going on, this has become much more serious and a much bigger problem than it was in uh, previous years. Now, when we really look at a lot of the vendors out there today, most of them will, will find these attacks in the, uh, when it's being delivered already. So when it's at the point where it's being delivered to the end users. At this point, you know, uh, the website has already been built. They've already uh, targeted their targets, send out the emails, and it's a bit too late at this point to start taking actions. So with Brand Exploit Protect, we actually want to take it one step to the left, and we want to find these attacks in these domains when they are being created. So we want to be able to take action early on, as early as possible, even before any of your end users are being uh, attacked and are being targeted. This will reduce a lot of the risk in these attacks and make sure that we keep the brand and your customers and employees as safe as possible. So we're all very familiar with the various methods that are available to protect end users. Uh, the problem is 
that the bad actors also know and can easily bypass them with a simple man in the middle attack or various other methods. So you might have two-factor authentication, geolocation-based solutions, device recognition, biometric solutions. They're great, but they're very easily bypassed as well. And knowing and just knowing that they're there is enough for an attacker uh, just to bypass this. So the key message for all customers should be your customers are not security experts. Please do not rely on them to identify suspicious or malicious websites. You know, ultimately, attackers will use and use any option they have to get people to a phishing site to steal credentials, personal information, try to get money or uh, their ident identity. So your customers and supply chain are not security experts. You can't rely on them to make the difference between a legitimate website and a not, not legitimate one. So what has changed in recent years within the attacking landscape? So more and more attackers rely on easy to use automated tools, meaning Essentially, anybody can set up an attacking website. You don't need to be tech savvy. You don't need to know about a, a, not a lot about attacks, which results in a much higher amount of attackers. Older tools aren't able to cope with new attack methods as more and more sophisticated and elusive techniques are being built to evade older defenses, which require being more agile when it comes to actually defending, finding the ways to defend against these types of attacks. So how do we really try to handle the, uh, these attacks? So we have three pillars. These three pillars are the early detection. So we want to be one step of the competition and obviously one step of the attacker, because when we can see this attack before it's even being launched, it means that we can take action very early on. That's where our proactive approach comes into play. So while we do have the superior technology, we always have an analyst going over all the findings, ensuring if it's legitimate or malicious. Uh, we try not to bother the customer unless there is a high chance of malicious activity. So this is very important. We're a fully managed service, uh, essentially providing a hands-free experience to the customer. So we will be doing all the work for you. After that happens, when we do find the attack, we have this, this uh, swift response. So we detect, we react, and we eliminate and make sure that the customer's brand is kept safe and its customers can work in a safe and secure environment. So how does it really work? How do we find these uh, domains? So again, this uh, is divided into three pillars. The first one is the proactive intelligence. That is our monitoring system into which we input the brand name. And we ask our system to find any domain that has been registered that is even remotely similar to the brand name. So we put in the brand name and we ask our system to find, for example, any domain up to two character manipulations. So it can be switches of letters or additions of letters in the middle or uh, use of IDN letters, which are non-Latin characters. We can find domains, we can find subdomains. And once we do find them, these, what happens is they're added to our system and our system starts to monitor them, starts to gather information and intel. So it will look at the site content, it will look at the DNS records, uh, the who is records, certificates. And essentially what it will do is it'll start comparing it to things that it's seen in the past, obviously using your main domain as a baseline of what it's looking for. So if it sees your web, website content on a domain that you don't own, it's going to assume that it's an attack, obviously, because why are they hosting your content? That's one, one way of, uh, that we do find these domains. The second way is our threat detection agent, uh, which is a JavaScript code that goes into the website's HTML. And what this does is it actually looks at your site's content and not the domain name. So when your content is being scraped or copied and uploaded somewhere else, we're able to see it. In this case, it doesn't matter what the domain name is. It could be xyz.com, abc.net. It doesn't matter. As long as it's hosting your content where it's not supposed to be and our threat agent is inside that content, we will know about it. Now, this uh, threat agent obviously is built to hide itself. So it hides itself in plain sight, making sure that attackers aren't aware of it, uh, won't remove it, make sure that it stays there if the site is copied. Uh, using several methods. This is uh, an IP that we built in-house. So we are in the, in the process of actually patenting how it's uh, hiding itself. So again, like I said, we're a fully managed service. So finding these domains is not where we stop. We actually go to the remediation. We want to take down these domains, make sure that they're blocked, make sure that they're not a threat for long. Obviously we're talking about a legal takedown. So we're not going to DDoS a website. We're not going to hack into the infrastructure or anything of that nature. We actually use uh, 
we actually use all of our dedicated APIs that we have with registrars, hosting providers, certificate issuers, uh, all of the endpoints to make sure that we're able to take down these websites as quickly as possible. Uh, using these methods, we actually have an average takedown of about three hours, which is, I think, the quickest in the market. And we also make sure that we block all of them. So we want to block them in the endpoints. We want to block them in antiviruses, web extensions. Uh, we're also part of Virus Total. So if you know Virus Total, you'll see us there whenever we, we block in a, a website. And we also do have the option to, to have some data theft countermeasures uh, should the need arise. So again, what's, what makes us different? First of all, I'm happy to say we have a takedown execution rate of 100%, 100% so we're able to take down anything that has come our way so far. Uh, we work completely outside of, uh, of your infrastructure, so no integration, no configuration needed on your end. Uh, we use a unique algorithm which covers multiple layers of the web. Uh, we utilize machine learning and AI to make sure that we can improve the detection rate as much as possible so we can look at hundreds of thousands of domains on a daily basis uh, using our system to do that. Like I said, our web scraping tracker is undis undiscoverable. All of our takedowns are done in-house, whereas in many co other companies, they either use a third party or they don't actually do takedowns themselves. Like I said, we do have APIs with over 2,000 entities to make sure that we can, we can take down these domains and block them as, as quickly as possible. And of course, we have a full, fully hands-free experience for the customer. So essentially, you wouldn't really need to do anything on your end. All will be done for you, but you do have a, a dashboard wiki where you can go and see exactly what we see and uh, track uh, the services. So again, don't take our word for it. Here are some quotes from existing customers. Uh, obviously, we can't name them. That's just part of uh, the you know part of the security environment we work in. But uh, the first one is actually from a POC with one of the largest banks in the U.S., which is also one of the bank, uh, largest banks in the world. Uh, they said the Mimecast detected 20 severe attacks in two weeks where existing vendors detected only one. So the actual bank itself has thousands of attacks on a yearly basis, but they actually wanted us to look at one of their smaller subsidiaries where they weren't sure exactly what was going on. So they did get a one attack once every six months, once every seven months, something like that. And they thought, okay, so we have one attack, awesome, not too bad. But then they actually asked us to bake off with three of their current vendors, where we found 20 severe attacks, meaning uh, live websites, trying to harvest credentials up and running that their current vendors just didn't see, where they only saw one. Another one of our current customers is a Fortune 500 banking uh, firm in Europe. They say that Mimecast detected attacks 24 to 48 hours before any of our other exist existing vendors did. So they actually do have, a they're part of a group, so they have a group-wide agreement with one of our competitors, but the bank itself is willing to pay more money uh, for us to look at their brand because we just find them so much quicker. And that means that they will lose less money from these attacks and they will have uh, their less repercussions from these, from these types of attacks because we see them 24 to 48 hours before uh, their current uh, vendors. Uh, what I wanna do really quickly is just jump uh, to the dashboard for a second, just so you can see what the dashboard is, how it looks. Uh, so again, this is our dashboard. Um, this is the type of dashboard any customer gets. You can see what, what you can get visibility into what we find. You can get more information about every URL that we detect. Um, so if you go into a URL here, you can see exactly what the, what the type of information uh, is that you're going to get. So you can see the site content, full HTML, uh, full HTML code. Obviously, you can look at the website. We don't want you to go into the website because, again, it might be malicious. It might have zero-day zero viruses on it. We want to make sure that you are kept as safe as possible. Uh, you can see DNS records, the WHOIS records, certificates. If there were any issue to it, you would see it here. And it's important to say that all of this information is being stored, so you can always go back and forth, and you can see the evolution of the website. So again, in this specific case, it's not a very interesting website. Uh, but uh, you wouldn't be able to see any, anything that changed. So if there were any DNS records, changes, any who's records, changes, and we make sure to scan this very, uh, very quickly. Now, again, because we're Mimecast, we also want to leverage the fact that we are an email security uh, company. So you can all, if you have the Mimecast email gateway and Mimecast web security features, you can also set up the integration to them. 
meaning you can actually leverage our zero day detection uh, capabilities because we do detect these domains when they're being registered and set up block policies even before any emails are being sent in. So you can use our information to keep your employees safe from potential threats. So you can block the sender domain, making sure that no emails from this domain would go into your uh, company. And you can also block a URL uh, using the web security feature, meaning uh, nobody from your company could click a link to any URL within this domain or a specific one within this domain. So if the attack is only on a subdomain of a legitimate domain, you don't want to block the whole domain, but you do want to block that specific subdomain. Uh, within our dashboard, you're going to get weekly and monthly reports generated automatically for you. Uh, you can just go ahead and download them. And again, like I said, very little is needed from you uh, on this dashboard. It's mainly for uh, visibility purposes. So I'm going to pop back into, uh, sorry, pop back in, uh, back into here. Uh, so again, like I said, uh, we do have that integration in place with the Mimecast uh, security solutions to make sure that we can leverage our data and get them blocked internally as quickly as possible. And as Werno said, uh, these are the three pillars of Mimecast. So if you really look at it, at the bottom, you have uh, the current Mimecast email gateway, making sure that you're safe from malicious emails internally. You have DMARC protecting domains that you own. And on top of that, you have Brand Exploit Protect, uh, protecting you against domains that you, don't know, you, that you don't own and are out there in the wild. Thanks, Roy. Thank you very much for that uh, and for that presentation. I have to say, um, I'd like to extend uh, you know, thanks to you and Ronald for, for brilliant presentations. Um, I conduct a lot of of webinars over the last year, and I think you are you both articulately articulately conveyed your points. You know, there's a lot of uh, information for us to consume, but I thought you delivered it in a way that was very clear uh, and very concise. And the, and the same with Ronald. So a big thank you to both for for what was two brilliant, comprehensive, in-depth uh, forensic presentations that have laid the foundations for a for a really good Q and A discussion. So I'd like to invite. Roy, if you can stay on, and, and I'd like to invite Ronald back on, and uh, Werner as well, and uh, we'll get stuck into a little Q&A session now, if that's okay with you guys. Sure. sure. So I'll just wait till you're all on, and we'll get started. So we've had a few questions, guys, that have came in uh, from the attendees, so that's always a good sign uh, of engagement, uh, let me tell you that from experience. Uh, we got a question from Anouk, who asked about how would you stand different to challenge the native um, 0365 email security offering in terms of cost and performance? Now, I don't know which one of you uh, want to respond to that, uh, but feel free to, to take the floor. I'm happy to kick that off and then Roy and, uh, Ronald can, can add. But Perfect. I think, if, um, you know, I, I did answer the question sort of briefly in, in the chat. But I think, uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's a standard risk mitigation factor. So if we put cost and performance aside, uh, one of the biggest steps is that, you know, we, we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. So standard risk mitigation tells us a multi-vendor approach does support with, uh, with, with the risk mitigation. But from a performance point of view, what we do is we run email security risk assessment reports. Uh, essentially, what we do is we, we sit behind uh, another vendor like Office 365 or, or any other security vendor. And what will happen is we will scan all the emails that, it, that has passed through that security vendor and then we'll provide the customer with a report. So this comes down to what we call efficacy. So how efficient are we in detecting the, 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 the right threats? And essentially, um, on average with an Office 365, it's, it's anything between 18 to 25%, so around 20% mark sort of average. Of, uh, of what we detect, um, which hasn't been detected in, in, in their world. And that's for various reasons. So that specifically talks to performance per se. Um, and then from a cost point of view, uh, I mean, it's com comparable from a like to like comparison, but uh, I think the bigger picture here is it's more importantly so that you have things like the brand exploit protect the DMARC services and all host of other services, which does not exist in your Office 365 world today. So our services are there to augment Office 365. Don't compete with it, right? So um, 
these specific services that, that Ronald and, and Roy was referring to today mm. are a very good example of that um, and how that actually integrates with your gateway services at the same time because that plays a critical role. Um, we invest in various vendors today and it is so important that you have the capability to be able to share threat intelligence across those vendors. Of course. Um, so if your gateway is seeing malicious traffic, can it inform your your, your firewall, can it inform your endpoint? And those are best of breed vendors. So it might not be Microsoft or Palo Alto across the board. Um, you know, you might pick different uh, strategies across those, but as long as they can talk to one another, you have a sense of what we call community defense. Um, and, and that, you know, I think plays another very important role in, in today's challenges that organizations face. Yeah, it gives you an opportunity to obviously to respond and uh, to, to any issues that may may arise. But Werno, I know you addressed that question in the in the chat. So thanks, a million, for expanding on that. Uh, I don't know if, if Roy or Ronald want to add anything to uh, to what Werno's already said. So if you do, please feel free. Yes. Well, well, keep in mind that um, traditional email security is not really focused on getting outbound control. So so DMARC is really focusing on or is also focusing on email which is sent from some mail server somewhere in the world to one of your customers or one of your partners. And in that specific situation, your inbound email security solution will not solve anything. It, 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 you, you really need to protect your domain with DMARC in order to cover that part. Okay, so that's key. Okay, no, that's brilliant. Thanks for, thanks for uh, re reinforcing what, what, what Werno said. So that was excellent. Uh, obviously, we had another question, which again, Werno addressed uh, uh, briefly in the chat, and it was to, to manage, the question was to manage three domains for a company that has an employee base of between 20 to 50 located in Dubai. What would your indicative cost for the tool and professional service to go through the DMARC journey be? Obviously, it's probably hard to, to, to talk about specific costs, but maybe I don't know where if you want to maybe expand again on that and maybe chat a little bit more on that. Um, so let me know if you do. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, it, it works in bundles of different domains. So we bundle the cost depending on the, the number of domains that the company has to that. But uh, the reason why we need actually a, a copy of the domains or just the name of the actual <coughs> domains is, is we put them through uh, a ranking system known as Alexa ranking. Le so, Alexa ranking, sorry. Alexa ranking, yeah, you can Google it, you'll see, you'll find it uh, available today. And that basically talks of how much website traffic does that domain see, essentially. And based on that, it falls into a tiering system. Uh, and then we, we price it accordingly for that. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, and maybe to add on, sorry, uh, that's based on the licensing services. And then, of course, there's a, a managed services portion to it that you can add as well which is the compliance piece. So how do we get you from a zero or you don't have a DMOC policy implemented at all or published DMOC records published all the way through to a reject policy. So that's a journey that, uh, that Ronald explained that we take you on and we support you with that process uh, all the way to a reject policy. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Warren, again for that. Um, Obviously, as, as I touched upon before I started the q and I thought the presentations from, from both Roy and, and Ronald was brilliant. Ronald, I want to go to you first because, because um, you kick-started it. And as I said, it was a brilliant presentation. But for example, if I was a, a business and I haven't implemented DKIM and, and SPV yet in terms of my operations, can, could I already use uh, DMARC or, or what's, the sort of, what's the situation that would face itself there for me? Yes, well, it's, it's really a misunderstanding that you that you um, have to need to have SPF and DKIM first before you start with DMARC. Probably because SPF and DKIM uh, were invented first and DMARC was introduced later on. But DMARC is introduced in order to protect your domain, but also to get visibility on your email landscape and visibility on mm. SPF signing and DKIM signing. So even if you don't have anything uh, arranged around SPF and DKIM, and it's very good and very useful to, to, to start with DMARC because, well, within 48 hours, you will get visibility on your SPF and DKIM status. Um, you will 
get an ID on what's going wrong and you get an ID on what homework to do in order to fix yeah. your SPF and DKIM issues. So it's really important to, to, to start with DMARC in order to get an overview of your SPF and DKIM status. And it's very okay. useful. Yeah, yeah that's, that's brilliant. Well, just to flip that on its head, if I had SPF and DKIM already implemented, can I then enforce DMARC or? <laughs> And, and, and over there, the, the concept of alignment is really important. So um, by default, so, so let's say if, if you start yeah. with SendGrid and you do a default setup of your SendGrid send account, then there will be no alignment. So again, that concept of alignment is really an important one. Yeah. So by default, there will be misalignment for all the sources that you used to send out emails, so all third party sources. So if you start enforcing um, immediately, then it's very likely that your DMARC compliance percentage will be rather low because those um, already existing third parties that you use in order to send out email are not aligned. So it's absolutely not advisable to start enforcing immediately, just um, okay collect 30 days of data and then decide on um, if you can move over to an enforced policy based on your compliancy. And well, then you will probably notice that you have to do some homework for homework first. Uh, yeah, a lot of homework. I don't like homework. That's reminded me of school, uh, but you're advising against that. So th thanks for, for clarifying that, Ronald. Roy, I'm just going to bring you in now. Um, as I said, excellent presentation, but I suppose I'll, I'll ask you a rather direct question and just ask you, you know, sort of what differentiates, uh, you know, Minecast's portfolio of managed services versus other vendors uh, in the market? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so, again, like I did touch on it a bit on the presentation, mm. um, but a lot of our competitors today claim to have uh, fully managed services. Whereas we actually deliver on that. So I do know, I'm not going to go into names, but I do know that there are a couple of competitors that, uh, for example, give you the information, but don't actually perform the takedown. They ask you to, you know, they give you that, give you that information, send you on your way. Or uh, they use some type of third party vendor, meaning that you do have that bottleneck between when you're actually requesting the takedown until it gets to that, that team, then that team needs to start the takedown. And as we know, in this types of these types of cases, time is essential. So, having it all under one roof uh, ensures that you can take action very quickly and very early on, and with close to no work needed on on our end, on the customers end, when it comes to our case. So, just approving the takedown, and you're good to go. Brilliant, brilliant. And just to, to follow up on that, are you able to then detect sophisticated sort of man in the middle attacks as well? I know you sort of touched on that briefly as well in the presentation, but maybe you could just expand on that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so again, one of one of the one of our features is like I said, uh, the web scraping tracker, uh, where it looks at the site content uh, and tries to understand where it's hosted or where it's being accessed from. Now, a lot of the solutions today, again, don't really look or aren't able to detect that. So we do find that if somebody's, for example, using a reverse proxy server and sending, uh, sending somebody to your actual domain, but from a different domain name, and then obviously he's in charge of the whole session. He, know, he sees what people do, do. He sees you inputting your password. He sees you, uh, he's able to decide what you see and what you don't see on the, on, uh, the screen. We're able to detect that uh, using the web scraping tracker. Uh, it's a fairly common attack vector nowadays, which a lot of current tools aren't, just aren't able to see. Oh, thanks a million for that. Right, I just want to come back. We've got a couple of questions from Anoop as well that I think um, I think Roy can, Roy can answer as well. But before I get them up, I just want to go back to, to you, Ronald, in relation to DMARC and just ask you, how long does it take to move uh, from the monitor to, to, to reject? Uh, good, good question. It, 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 of course, depends on uh, different parameters. So, for example, the number of, of domains, that's really an important one. It's completely different um, if you if you have three domains or 300 active domains uh, that needs to um, have a DMARC uh, policy. So it little bit depends on your situation. So your domains, how many um, 
legitimate sources are there available and well what's the status of your legitimate sources um, what's the DMA compliance percentage if you start with the project but in general I always say well it, it, it takes six up to 12 months in order to reach a reject policy and um, well that the, the reason why it takes six up to 12 months is that you first need to start collecting data well, then there's already one month. Um, it takes it takes one month in order to have enough data and start in order to start your analysis. And then you really want to make sure that you've covered all your legitimate sources. So you have to be careful that you switch not too early to a reject policy because then you will lose legitimate email. So six to twelve months. Well, that's I think a good in indication. And that's brilliant, Ron. And look, obviously, during your presentation, you sort of highlighted a range of sort of unique capabilities that make DMARC is sort of a, a must have and not a, and not a nice to have. But if I was to put you on the spot and just say, you know, what is the key differentiator of that tool and, and what makes it special? Yeah, and I know that's a hard question. What would you what would you say? Yeah, I would I would say. <laughs> Pro protection of your brand. I think that's the most that's important the one. Protection of your brand. It's it's really a no-brainer. So ask everyone, do you want someone else sending email on behalf of your domain? Well, I don't think that there will be a lot of people um, um, giving you an answer that they don't have a problem with it because, well, you, you don't want that others are sending email on behalf of your domain. So I think brand protection, well, that's the most uh, most important one. That's brilliant. Thanks again, Ronald. That's superb. Uh, Roy, I've got a question from Anup, and he is wondering that, say, a, a website article is copied and published uh, by another entity without their consent. Can that be tracked and reported across all channels like social media and, and websites? Are you able to respond to that? Yeah, so uh, I just want to make sure that I understand. We're talking about uh, an article that was yeah. a malicious yeah. article. Okay. Yeah, so there are a few a few things that that could happen here, uh, and again, if if they're trying to impersonate the brand, uh, they're going to probably use a domain or a brand or a social media name uh, similar to the brand name, and that could raise our alarm our alarm bells. Um, definitely, um, once picked up, uh, depending again, depending on on what is written there, in many cases, you can probably take it down using uh, a DMCA takedown, so copyright infringement. Uh, okay. Again, depending on, on what is actually said there, uh, there's always a fine line between what's legitimate and what isn't legitimate. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely, if they're using any type of uh, branding, like the domain name or uh, the account name, that can be picked up and can be taken down as well. That's brilliant. Cheers, thanks a million for that, Roy. I just got another question in there, and this is in relation to the, the DMARC. Um, so, Ronald, you can take this. If DMARC is in reject mode, uh, can no email spoof happen? Is that is that is that removed? Can you answer that, Ron? It's um, it's certainly still possible if you are on on a reject mode. Um, that malicious senders um, are sending email on behalf of your domain, but well, it's not very smart to do that. Because well, if you if you are using a domain, then you want to have impact, and the impact will be very low. So why should a malicious sender use a domain which is pr protected with a reject policy if there are still a lot of domains that are not protected with with a reject policy? So what we in general see, as soon as you are on reject policy, well, within two weeks they really stop sending email on behalf of your domains. So it will drop enormously. And well, that's that's also because if they use your domain, then they will get a notification. So they will get a bounce message. You, you send an email on behalf of this domain and that's not possible because there's a DMARC reject policy on it. So you can count on it. A malicious actor will stop using your domain and move over to your neighbors who has no DMARC protection. Brilliant. Ron, another really comprehensive answer. Thank, thanks so much. And look, guys, I think we've, we've gone slightly over there and, and the Q&A, but I, I want to first of all thank Ronald, uh, Werno and, and Roy for their time. I think uh, all three have, have provided huge value and, and real quality and insights into 
into what is a very uh, pressing sort of insight and, and, and topic here in the IT industry at the minute. So I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm sure you found it uh, very valuable as well. We've had great feedback and I think as Werner touched upon as well uh, when he responded to them, feel free, please, to reach out to, to myself or the guys at Mimecast. I'll put you in contact with the, with the people you need to speak to and you can uh, take the conversation on uh, away from this uh, public forum here now and, and, and talk in, in more detail. Uh, behind the scenes. So on behalf of myself uh, and CPI Media Group, I want to thank again all our attendees for joining. I want to thank Ron O'Broy and Werner for their time this morning and all our attendees uh, for joining. We do really appreciate it and it's been an excellent session. So for me, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll maybe hand over, I don't know if Ronald or Werner or Roy want to say anything, uh, but that's it for me and I just want to thank you all for your participation and time today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for um, for hosting it today. I think uh, you know there's a lot of detail around DMARC if we get quite technical and around the the brand exploit protect services. So uh, Roy has touched on things like DMCA or, or uh, infringement type takedown. There are different types of takedowns as well, um, and that is dependent on also the registrars, etc., on how long that takedown would take in the end of the day. So. Uh, there are compl complexities around both these, these types of services, so it's, it's good to sort of have a deep dive and have a good understanding of what it actually means. Uh, so we are um, more than open to host those sessions, so you can reach out directly to us or the team, and, um, and we can set those up for you. But uh, thank you very much for the time today. I hope uh, everyone found it informative and uh, useful.